the thing that that really brings to light is that one of the things that I think that we lose sight of when we're trying to decide, should we stop what we're doing, is we don't really consider very well what we call opportunity costs, which is what are the other things I could be doing with this time? What other things could I pursue? What else could I spend this money on? Those kinds of questions. And I think we're pretty bad at considering those things. Well, when you're forced to quit, you have to consider those things. You don't have a choice but to consider them. And what you find out is, you know what? There's a lot of good stuff out here. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Grand Slam Journey Podcast, where I, together with my guests, discuss various topics related to finding our passion and purpose, maximizing our potential, sports, life after sports, and transitioning from one chapter of our lives to the next, growing our skills and leadership, and whatever we decide to put our minds into. For my guest today, areas of decision-making under uncertainty and education. If you're someone who's been following poker, or you're a fan of how to make better decisions, my guest today needs no introduction. I bring you Annie Duke. Annie loves to dive deep into decision-making under uncertainty. Her latest obsession is on the topic of quitting. I love her book, Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. And this book inspired one of my conversations with Anna and Dana, episode number 41, if you want to go back and re-listen to it after this episode. Annie is an author, speaker, and consultant in the decision-making space, as well as special partner focused on decision science at First Round Capital Partners, a seed stage venture fund. Annie's latest book, Quit. The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away was released in 2022. Her previous book, Thinking in Bets, is a national bestseller. As a former professional poker player, she has won more than 4 million in tournament poker during her career. Annie won a World Series of Poker Bracelet and is the only woman to have won the World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions and the NBC National Poker Heads Up Championship. She retired from the game in 2012. And yet, she still remains among some of the top women that have won the most amount of money, even though she has not been competing for over a decade. Prior to becoming a professional poker player, Annie was awarded a National Science Foundation Fellowship to study cognitive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Annie is the co-founder of the Alliance for Decision Education, a nonprofit whose mission is to improve lives by empowering students through decision skills education. She is a member of the National Board of After School All-Stars and the Board of Directors of the Franklin Institute and serves on the board of the Renew Democracy Initiative. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a few months, and it has been such a joy having Annie on the podcast. During this conversation, Annie shares her journey from academia to poker and back to academia, and how her upbringing prepared her for career in poker accidentally, which at the time was not something at all she could have even foreseen or aspiring to become, and then finding her path back to teaching and research, which were her first passions. You may not know this, but Amy really enjoys the game of tennis. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity to dive into some of the similarities and differences between tennis and poker. We then talk through some poker strategies and how we could apply them to tennis, particularly shot selection and strategic thinking. Annie emphasizes the importance of doing what works rather than what looks good 
and discusses how players should adjust their approach based on their level of skill, whether you're a poker player or a tennis player. And then we also dive into handling stress and high stakes situation. Annie explains how keeping opponents guessing is crucial and emphasizes the importance of viewing chips as tools and how this mindset can help players make better decisions. And we also talk about the importance of maintaining focus and calmness in high-stakes situations that applies to all, poker, tennis, and life. Annie emphasizes the need to focus on task at hand and not get caught up in the overall outcome and to make the right play regardless of past wins or losses. Wouldn't it be great if this was the motto for our life overall? We also explore some of the challenges for women in poker and women in male-dominated fields in general. She also discusses the low percentage of female entrants in the World Series of Poker and shares her personal experience from the poker tour. Last but not least, we dive into Annie's decision to quit and her journey Post Poker, writing a fantastic book I highly recommend you checking out, such as her latest book, Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away, How to Decide, and Thinking in Bets. Please check out the episode notes for all of the resources Annie mentioned in the podcast. As always, if you enjoyed this conversation, Please share it forward with someone you believe may enjoy it as well. Consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And now I bring you Annie Duke. Annie, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to Grand Slam Journey Podcast. I've been such a huge fan of yours and all your work and all you do and literally have been looking forward to this conversation for a few months. When your uh, admin told me that you accepted, I literally had to run out of the house and do a happy dance. Well, thank you, Clara. I had such a big rush of energy. And so I hope this will be fun for both of us and look forward to diving into all the work that you do, including your poker career that obviously relates a lot into decision-making as well as tennis, because I've heard on one of your podcasts that your dad and perhaps you are a tennis player, so which... That's my upbringing and where I come from. Oh, okay. Well, we'll have to definitely talk about tennis. I was playing tennis this morning, as a matter of fact. Oh, same here. <laughs> there we go, which is why my hair is up like this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But for anyone listening who may actually not know you, I hope there are not many people. I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself briefly. I'm Annie Duke. I have a PhD in cognitive science, a strange journey with the PhD, because when I was right out of college, I went to University of Pennsylvania and did five years worth of my PhD work there in cognitive science at the time, got sick literally right at the end. I mean, I was going out for my job talk. So I was had already gotten I sent interviews for uh, tenure track positions, but I got sick. I had a stomach issue that caused me to have to take time off. So during that time off, I needed money and I started playing poker. So I did not go back at that time to the program for my PhD. I actually ended up continuing to play poker and just kind of had a knack for it and and really loved poker because it was very much like a high stakes, real time decision making exercise, which was real practical application of the kinds of things that I've been studying. and cognitive science about learning under uncertainty and decision-making under uncertainty. So I played poker for 18 years, ended up with some championships, which was really nice. I won a World Series of Poker Bracelet and the NBC National Heads Up Championship. At one point, I was the winningest woman in poker, not anymore. Since I retired in 2012, there's lots of people who have passed me. I think I might be number five now. I'm not sure. But I haven't played since 2012, and there are lots of women who are much better than I am now. But 
overlapping with my poker career for about 10 years, I actually dove back into cognitive science and started thinking about the way that poker and cognitive science could really inform each other. So the way that those two disciplines had like a really interesting conversation where not just the cognitive science could really help you understand the problem that poker was presenting, but more importantly, from the perspective of what I was exploring, the way that poker could really help to inform the cognitive science. And I started thinking about that for 10 years. I started giving talks on that topic, sort of diving back into writing on it, and then retired from poker in 2012 because I really wanted to write a book on that topic, which ended up being Thinking and Bets, which I was lucky enough people were interested in it and ended up being a national bestseller. It was really thinking about decisions as bets and how that's a really helpful frame for thinking about decision-making under uncertainty. Ended up back teaching at Wharton, doing research with Phil Tetlock and Barb Mellers back at Penn, and then wrote two more books, How to Decide, and then quit The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away, which came out in October of 2023. Um, That was also a bestseller, which was exciting. And in the meantime, sort of during that period, I was deep into research with Phil Tadlock and Bart Mellers on forecasting. That ended up turning into a dissertation, which then allowed me to complete my PhD, which just happened this year. Congratulations. That's my journey. I love it. And I feel there's so much in the journey to unpack. So look forward to diving into many aspects. But before we do, I'm also always curious about how we uncover at least our first passion in life. And so what drove you to poker? I actually did some research. It seems like you grew up in Concord, New Hampshire, and your family was quite big in cards. But I want to hear from you. How was your upbringing? And how do you believe that childhood prepared you for then later on your professional poker career, which you probably haven't even foreseen coming at that point? Well, I certainly wouldn't have foreseen it because, you know, I think that people forget since poker has been pretty ubiquitous on television for 20 years now, obviously internet poker has been a big thing for at least 15 years, more than that, probably. So most people growing up now see poker as like a legitimate profession, like something that people could actually do for a living. When I was growing up, there was no such thing. Like poker wasn't on television. There actually wasn't an internet, (laughs) to be fair. So there was certainly no internet poker. And it was very firmly in the category of gambling even though poker is not gambling by definition. Gambling means trying to win when you are at a mathematical disadvantage. And some people play poker at a mathematical disadvantage, certainly, but it is a game of skill. And so there's lots of people who play poker at a mathematical advantage, which means they are not gambling, at least definitionally, right? But when I was growing up, there was no like, oh, maybe I'll be a poker player when I grow up. Because I think that the way people would react to that would be somewhere between maybe I'll be a professional craps player or maybe I'll just be a drug dealer, right? Like (laughs) it's kind of in the same category. So it certainly didn't cross my mind. My dad was an academic, is an academic. He was a teacher at the school actually that I went to high school at. During my childhood, he actually went and got his PhD in linguistics and he ended up being a writer writing about words and language and just really loved words and language. So academics was kind of something that was revered when I was growing up. And I think that I always just kind of assumed that I would be some sort of academic and follow in those footsteps. That being said, our social time as a family was spent playing cards and games. My dad and mom met over a game of bridge and they continued to play bridge when I was growing up. And We played lots of gin and a game called Oh Hell, which is a little bit of a simpler version of bridge, but like Scrabble, things like that. A tiny bit of poker, not a lot, but we probably played card games four nights a week, I would say. So this was really woven into the fabric of our family. So certainly that had to have helped with becoming a poker player because There are just certain things that you understand about playing a game where like information is hidden. There's an influence of luck 
And in any card game, that's going to be true because you can't see your opponent's cards in any of the games that we would have been playing. And there's a random deal of the cards. So you're sort of learning how to navigate that space whenever you're playing cards. I think it's actually very helpful for understanding sort of the probabilistic nature of the world and what it's like to make decisions without information. I think that that definitely prepared me for what I ended up doing, but it wasn't something that I would have planned. It's not something where I would have said, my passion is to be a card player. I think because the opportunity wasn't available to me. And even so, like, I don't know that I would have ever said that that was the thing that I wanted to do with my life, because I think that I really did want to be an academic and a teacher. And I think that that was something that was very important to me. And I always sort of had felt that way. So the accident that occurred, which was me getting sick and just needing money and thinking that I'm going to do something in my time off, my childhood definitely prepared me for that. But poker wasn't my first passion. Teaching was my first passion. Mm -hmm. Research was my first passion. There's no question about that. And I think that The way that I know that is that even though I found this other passion, which was poker, pretty quickly, actually eight years in, I found my way back to teaching because when I was giving talks to companies, talks are obviously teaching. (laughs) Like I'm essentially giving lectures. We just give a different word to it. Like I'm giving a talk, a keynote speech, something like that to a company. And so I started thinking in that space and how do I actually teach these concepts now that I have this different platform? And I did that for 10 years. And then writing a book is teaching and exploring your own ideas, which is part of what makes teaching really exciting is that you have to explore your own ideas in order to communicate them to other people. And then I ended up back at Wharton. I teach executive ed there. (laughs) Then I ended up back doing research continuing to write in an academic way. And even when I was in poker, I taught poker. So that's clearly that first passion that I had. And I've just found different ways to express it. But I would have never ended up playing poker if I hadn't gotten sick. It wouldn't have occurred to me to find this sort of secondary thing that I was very passionate about. I think that's interesting. And what comes into mind is the quote from Steve Jobs. You can't ever connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. And it really seems like serendipitously in you know good or bad way in some shape or form, it happens that the world pulled you into this game of poker, which seemed like at that moment, the best option you have had to survive financially. And then it's so beautiful how you used that journey of poker, which is making decisions under uncertainty. I'm using your words. I've listened to many of your podcasts, which I never thought about poker that way, actually, until I've heard you talk about it. And then you apply it back to how we think and how we make decisions. And I, again, left left all your book. So I hope we dive into all of that soon. But I'm also curious about your tennis background, because I've heard on another podcast that your dad was a tennis player, Have you played any sports or tennis when you were young or was that later on? Okay. So my dad was a tennis player until this year. Oh, wow. So he just turned 85 and he has gone to the dark side and he's playing pickleball. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) And the reason is that his rotator cuffs are kind of shot. And so it's very hard for him to bring his hands over his head, Mm -hmm. which makes pickleball more ideal. The other problem is he's 85 and it's just hard for him to get a foursome together. Yes. Whereas if he goes over to pickleball, there's always like 80 people waiting. You know, yeah. he can always get a pickleball game. So he resisted for a very long time. I'm resisting to pickleball so far too. <laughs> I'm totally resisting. I won't do it. I mean, no offense to pickleball players, but I sneer at you. <laughs> but he has now, pickleball is what he plays, but he played until he was 85. Amazing. And he was really good. So I did play some tennis when I was little. The thing about my dad, and I'm sure that this certainly influenced me as an academic or me as a poker player, is that my dad really likes to win. (laughs) He even likes to win when he's playing against someone who's like four. Oh, my dad was the same way, by the way. So it's like we share the upbringing. (laughs) So when I was learning tennis, it was before they had red ball orange ball, Mm -hmm. green ball. 
not only that, I was learning on clay where, you know, the bounce is quite high. Yes. And so I was little and I was short and my dad was six, four, and I'm sure he was trying to feed <laughs> the ball to me, but it was bouncing <laughs> over my head. How I wish they had red balls. It would have made it a lot better. You know, I took lessons until I was eight. But then when I was eight, every picture of me when I was little, I'm upside down. Like every picture (laughs) I'm on my head. And so I think my parents, when I was eight, were like, she's always upside down. We should put her in gymnastics. So I went into gymnastics and that took out all the tennis time away because not only did I do gymnastics during the year, but I also went to camp, to gymnastics camp. Wow. You're a serious gymnast. I was a serious gymnast. Yeah. Like I wasn't an elite gymnast. So they have different ways that they categorize it now. But at the time there was class beginner, class three, class two, class one, and then elite. And I was class one. Wow. I was good, but I wasn't like amazing, but I loved it. I was too tall to ever be super amazing, but I did love it. And from eight to 14, that's really what I did was gymnastics, which meant that tennis was very, very, very occasional, but I loved gymnastics. And then when I was in high school, I played soccer. I rode crew. And so I was always doing athletic stuff. Then I went to college in New York City. Any exercise I was getting was dancing at clubs. <laughs> so I wasn't exercising in college, except for I was doing a lot of dancing. But then when I went to graduate school, my advisor actually really loved tennis. And there were some other graduate students who really liked tennis. So I actually started playing a lot of tennis in graduate school. I would play singles with my advisor, singles with some of the other players. And then occasionally I would partner with my advisor for doubles. Sad for her because I had never really played doubles in my life. So I didn't know how to play the net. So I'm sure I was a terrible doubles player. Although at the time I didn't know it, it was fine. Because I I think maybe like the people she was playing with were three O's. So just because like I was young and I played tennis in my life was enough. And then like many people, I started having babies and tennis takes a long time and it's hard to do, but I was always exercising in some way. Exercise was very integral to my life. And then about 11 years ago, I was dating my now husband and he asked me right at the beginning, he was like, do you play tennis? And I said, well, yeah, but I haven't played in like 15 years or something. Like I'm sure I'm going to be terrible at it. But you know, like, I mean, I had a tennis racket in my hand when I was three. So there's only so terrible that you can be when you've played tennis for, you know, even if it was sporadically throughout your whole life. So we went out and we played a little singles and he called me a hustler (laughs) because I had given him such a thing about how I hadn't played in a while. But I realized like, oh my gosh, I really love it. And my kids were starting to be a little bit older, like be in school because my youngest at that point was 10. And so now it's like, there's more time and space in the day and I had more time and I started getting back into tennis. And since then, like I play almost every day. Wow. Impressive. Got totally back into it. My dad is so happy (laughs) because- It was his thing. And my sister, who was very good when we were young, she got to be number two, 12 year old in New Hampshire, the state that I grew up in. She really dropped it. So none of his kids really ended up playing tennis. So when I took it back up, he was like so thrilled. He was so happy. I was like, I'm so happy you get to share this joy that I've had for my whole life. And then my sister actually just took it back up, which makes him really happy. And like my dad was really good. He was an amateur. But he was always like the city champion and then the state champion in both doubles and singles. And then it would be like New England regional champion in both doubles and singles. And he was like, he was a great player. He played in college. And so he's just like, he was so happy that we ended up doing this. And so now like my exercise really comes mainly from tennis. I stopped all the other stuff, but I can still do like a cartwheel. I feel like gymnastics is such a great thing to prepare you for life overall, because you learn to use your whole body. I did gymnastics for a while. They dropped me early because they realized I was never a talent. And looking at my family, six foot tall gymnast, nobody I've ever seen. <laughs> so that doesn't happen often. I'm saying I was too tall and I'm only five, five now. And I was very clearly too tall. I will say that when I'm playing tennis and now I love the net, I'm, I actually, it's my preferred place to be, which is, I was terrified of before, but people always say, oh, you play very tall. That's great. But it's because I can jump really high in the air from back in my gymnastics days. So I can jump and I'm very flexible so I can get my arm sort of out of my joint to get a high ball. But yeah, the tall thing in gymnastics does not mix. Yes. I think I realized that early on, I was never really great at the competition and probably didn't have the inborn 
sort of even the feel of, you know, when you fall back, you got to get up and shake things off, which is such a great skill again for life, right? Overall, but I don't think I had the pain tolerance. I think gymnasts are on another level when it comes to tolerating pain and what you put your body through than tennis players. Well, yes, you're in pain a lot if you're a gymnast. It's true. I do just want to comment. We talked, we both played tennis this morning. I played doubles with some newfound friends that I'm trying to create a community here in Austin. And right next to me were four men. They were 91 years old and playing. How amazing If I'll be able to do this when I'm 91, I'm going to call my life a success. So kudos to your dad. And uh, I actually commend him on sticking with it and knowing when to quit and change, seems like, as well. Yeah, I think the really wonderful thing about tennis, which is very different than something like gymnastics, is that you can play through your whole life. And what my coach says, obviously, this wouldn't be true for somebody who's on a professional tour, but for an amateur he said, you can keep getting better until you're 70, you know, assuming your body can take it, right? Like you can keep getting better until you're 70. And then at 70, like, obviously you're probably going to break down a little and start going backwards. So like you have lots of runway and the fact is that there's a rating system. So you can match up against people who are going to be the right level for you. And so even if you do start sort of going the wrong direction, that's fine because you can find people who are at that level. And the other thing that I love about it, because it is by level, is that some of my best friends are 20 years younger than me because we're at the same level. And I partner with people because we make good partners. And so it's very age neutral, Mm -hmm. which I also really like. You're as likely to be hanging out with a 30-year-old as like, there's some great players who are 70 who you get to play with. The other thing is that it's such a social sport which I also think is really wonderful. So for me, it's a way to really meet people who I know are going to have a much higher likelihood of having characteristics that I would be attracted to in a friend. Because if you play tennis, you're going to tend to be pretty competitive. You're going to like to be athletic. You want to be moving around. You're going to tend to be a little bit on the perfectionist side, (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) Yes. Right? And so I know I'm picking from a group of people that I'm probably going to be more likely to get along with and like to actually form real friendships with. So I just think it's a wonderful game and totally love it. And my dad is so happy if he hears this. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm curious about the connection that you see or don't see between poker and tennis. Because when I was young, growing up, the saying has been on a tennis court, you need to have a poker face. So nobody should know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. It actually helps you with the strategy If the opponent doesn't know that you're in pain or you have negative thoughts, it actually only helps because you don't show it. And so you are actually the perfect person because you play high stakes poker. And I have to say, I've also seen poker as gambling, kind of similar to what you described until I started listening to you. And I know there is a lot of skill to it that goes into making the right decisions, but Actually, listening to you speaking really helped me rethink how I consider poker. And it made me think about some of the commonalities in tennis and how you play the game, because there is also a lot of the decision under uncertainty. You never know which ball is coming. And so really making the right decision. What is the best shot to hit from the ball that I have on my hand? Although the timing or the swiftness of the decision. I don't know if it's the same. You're better to comment. How do you see the two commonalities or differences? So the way that you figure out if a game is a game of skill, one of the simplest ways is to ask if somebody can lose on purpose. Hmm. So if you think about something like the lottery, and I'm assuming you're following the rules, right? So you're filling out your ticket and you're actually giving it to the shopkeeper. You cannot lose on purpose. You can't create a situation where you have a higher likelihood to lose than somebody else who is filling out their ticket. That's not true in tennis. If you wanted to lose a match in tennis on purpose, you could. And if I wanted to lose at poker on purpose, I could. Now notice, I did not say that what tells you if something is skill is that you can win on purpose, Mm. right? Because we know like in tennis, you can't win on purpose. It depends on who you're playing. And I can't win in poker on purpose. Okay, so let's just 
identify that. And that's going to separate games of skill from games of luck. So like Baccarat, for example, which is a casino game, is a game of luck because you can't do anything to make you more likely yeah. to lose than somebody else because the bets are sort of automatic, right? So there's nothing that you can do to make yourself lose. So now we understand that. So then what we can next say is, yes, it's a game of skill, but the question is how much luck is involved in the short-term outcome? Mm -hmm. And that's going to tell us kind of like how much volatility matters. How big of a skill gap do you need before you're going to get like a, a really clear result in the short run? So in a game like tennis, what we can think about is, this is true with any game, is that the narrower the skill gap, mm -hmm. the more the element of luck determines the outcome. So let's think about this for tennis. If I take the number one player in the world and they're playing the number thousand player in the world, the number one player will win every single time. So this is now a very large skill gap where luck is playing very little role in the outcome. That's not to say that there aren't luck things that are happening. Balls might be hitting the net cord and falling one way or the other, which we know is very much a matter of luck, so on and so forth. But yes. the appearance of luck is very small because skill is really determining that outcome. But if I take number one versus number two, now we've really narrowed the skill gap and the appearance of luck is going to be much greater. Things like, does Alcaraz cramp in the match? So that's just a matter of luck, right? So Alcaraz cramped at the French Open. He did not cramp at Wimbledon, right? Yes. And you'll see this kind of flip-flopping where sometimes Djokovic is winning, sometimes Alcaraz is winning, right? And it takes a lot of matches in order to actually figure out who is the more skilled. So we narrow that skill gap. Mm -hmm. right. So when we now think about that and we compare that to poker, basically the deal in poker is sort of twofold. Thing number one is that there's just more luck, period. Because you've got like this random deal of the cards, right? So yeah. there's more luck that sort of the skill gap has to overcome. So even if the number one player is playing the number 30 player, luck is going to have a, a much bigger influence on the outcome of that game than if the number one tennis player is playing the number 30 tennis player, mm -hmm. just because there's more luck in general. But then the other piece is that there's a narrower gap between most of the people who are playing poker, because once you know the certain things about the game, like the betting, checking, what hands to play, things like that, the things that will differentiate you are sort of smaller. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that it's going to take a longer time to figure out who the best player is, who's better than who. It's just going to appear over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's the same. So it's really just about how quickly can you figure that out, which is how much of an influence of luck is there generally in the game that the sort of skill gap has to overcome. Because if the skill gap is big enough, even though there's some luck involved, it's just not going to matter. So the way that you could think about that is that I could create a bot that played poker that was totally unskilled. In other words, it was random in its actions. So we could think about that like two aces in the game of Texas Hold'em are the very best hand. If the bot is random in its actions, it's as likely to fold that hand as play it. A skilled player is going to beat that bot very quickly. But as soon as I start to give the bot some skills, like aces are better than 7-2 and mm -hmm. things like that, it's going to be harder. So it's just, it's a longer feedback loop. But other than that, there's a lot of similarities between the two. So how can we make tennis exactly like poker? Like if the net cord got involved a lot more, if there was some roll of the dice that could make you randomly lose a game. Yeah. So we could start to create more luck elements where even if there was a roll of a dice that could randomly make you lose the game, what we know is that if you put Alcaraz against the number 30 guy, 
that Alcaraz is clearly in the long run going to win because the exertion of that element of luck, right? Like, do you win mm-hmm. this game on the roll of dice is going to be distributed equally between Alcaraz and his opponent. But what it's going to mean is that the opponent is just more often going to win in the short run because we've added this element of luck that could just go the opponent's way. Yeah. So that's the way that you could think about that. Otherwise, they're actually incredibly similar to each other. Yeah. Thank you. What actually came into mind this morning, I was playing against ladies and one of them kept hitting a lot of lets on the first serve. And I just had an idea, huh? It would be interesting how they would change the tennis game if the let on the serve and she kept hitting them actually in every single let she hit, it was actually a ball in, which came in in such a way you wouldn't be able to get it. And it made me think about if we were to change the rule in a way that this would now be legal and you have to play the point out. So they have in the U.S. and NCAA and college tennis, you have to play lets on the serve. You do now? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know because when I played, I think we still called them and they had to serve again. I have to say, I don't follow tennis as much as I used to. Yeah, it's an NCAA rule now. And and there's certain things like, as an example, in doubles in college, they play a superset mm-hmm. that adds an yep. element of luck, right? So yes. how can we tell that it adds an element of luck? When we think about the influence of luck, what we can think about is who is it hurting? Who is it helping? If you were to say, for example, should the number one player in the world, should they want to play a five setter or a super set? Mm. And the answer is very clear. The number one player in the world should always choose five sets. And the reason is that the more repetitions that you have, and this is true in poker as well, the more repetitions you have, the more that the skill will overcome whatever luck elements there are. So if you're a bad player, you should choose a superset because you could have something good happen to you, right? You could have a lot of let's go your way. As yes. an example, you could have some good net cords, like yes. the wind could be just going in your direction mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Like there's a variety of things that could happen to help you. And this is actually a very important principle is to understand that when you are an underdog, meaning that you are the less skilled, you should choose to bring more luck into the equation. And when you are more skilled, you that. should want to bring less luck into the equation. So if we think about how would that translate to tennis where like I can't choose how many sets that I'm playing against somebody, if I am the less skilled player, I should be taking on more risk, meaning I should be much more aggressive. I yes. should go for shots that are over the higher part of the net. You know, I should be going for more lines. And the reason is that if I hit that ball straight down the middle and I don't make a mistake, I will lose, right? So I could play a game against somebody who's much better than me and I could have no unforced errors, but I will lose yeah, because they will hit winners and they will give me forced errors, right? Mm -hmm. So I should be trying to up the volatility. So I should be going for more lines, which is a a less reliable shot. Mm -hmm. I should be going over the higher part of the net more, those kinds of things. And what's interesting is that in those situations, as you know, from playing tennis, people tend to do the opposite. So when people feel like they're outmatched, they tend to try to play safe tennis. And it's actually the opposite of the way that you should react in that situation. Yeah, I agree. What this comment made me think about, I'm actually now wonder even how does your poker decision-making skills and all the studies you have done now influence your tennis strategy. So when you play against people that are at least a similar level, do you see that because you're able to measure probabilities better and you've kind of trained this in a high stakes poker table, you are able to make the more accurate decision. So when it comes to some of the important points, do you see that it helps you perform? You know, I think these things are hard to say. I mean, what I would say is like what my partners would say about me, which is like, I have good shot selection, which is not surprising, I guess, given what my background is. I think that I construct points well, Mm -hmm. and that is definitely a poker skill because in poker, you have to plan many, many moves ahead. And so I tend to be like a point constructor. So nobody who watched me play would describe me as somebody who's just like a really hard hitter. The way that I play tennis is much more like thinking many shots ahead, trying to really figure out what my opponent's weaknesses are and going for that. 
And I think one of the things, and I definitely attribute this to poker, is that I am always fine choosing a shot that someone else might not think is a high level shot. Mm. So an example is that there's a certain point in tennis where I think that people think that lobbing is for silly people who are very good. I hate lobs. It's such a skill to have an amazing lob, but I'm not a lobber, but there's many people who lob me and I'm always angry. I was like, how is that even possible? Right. But I think that people don't think about it as like a good shot Mm. or an offensive shot, right? It's not like that ridiculous power forehand that's like going to rip through Mm. the middle. And so I find that there's a lot of people who are like reluctant to lob a lot because Mm. they sort of feel like it makes them look like a bad player. And for me, I'm like, if the lob is the right shot, I'm going to hit a lob. I don't care. I'm just going to go over your head. And maybe it doesn't look like the most fabulous shot. But in my mind, it's the right strategic shot, which makes it a fabulous shot. And I remember playing a match a few years ago. And it was a very windy day. And if you sort of take a windy day and you decide to sort of lob to the center Depending on which side of the court you're on, you're either lobbying purposely a little bit short or purposely a little bit long. It's very hard for them to track that ball. So I must have thrown up a gazillion lobs. Like I'm actually not someone who likes to let lobs bounce, but on like a super windy day, I'll just let the lob bounce. I'll throw up another one if you happen to have gotten it. Anyway, so we won that match and I came off and my opponents were just very angry at me. And basically insulted me by being like, nice lobby. Wow, that's kind of weird. I hate that type of behavior. Nice (laughs) lobby. right? And I was like, okay, nice lobby, whatever. So I think that there's this thing that comes from playing poker, which is that you do the thing that is strategically correct. And it doesn't really matter whether your opponents admire your game or think you're incredible or that what you did is so amazing. Because you're actually sort of trying to stay under the radar and you don't necessarily want people to notice what you're doing. And that's not to say that there aren't things that I do on the tennis court where people are afraid to hit a shot to me because they kind of know that a scary shot is going to come back to them. I mean, obviously that's just true and that's true at poker as well. But I want to do what works, not what looks good. Yeah. You know, I think that's the biggest sort of lesson that I take from poker over to tennis is like, do what works, not what looks good. Yeah. I think there's so much wisdom in that. And I wish I learned that wisdom even earlier when I was still really (laughs) competing in tennis. It takes certain, I think, maturity. And maybe that comes with getting to know yourself and being okay with what others think. And obviously a right decision making. I'll tell you like a shot like that is chipping. Yes. It looks like such a, like, oh, you're just starting the point, but it's not. It's a great way to get yourself into the net. And a lot of people don't like a chip because it's low, particularly if you chip to the backhand, but it's not a power return Mm -hmm. that like goes flying like off into the corner of the court. And I think people don't like to use that shot because I think they think it looks sort of silly. I love to chip because I think it's very effective. It is. There is not much you can do from that shot. I have to say I'm more of a power hitter. So I go for the big shots. I've never been the touchy-feely person. And that probably comes a little bit with, I think there was a certain level of style. Now, as I look back, that we're taught most of the time in specific countries. And so being from the Czech Republic, I think if you look at all the Czech tennis players, we have a powerful game. Typically, we create the game. And so that's sort of the style that we have been taught. What I would say about that is, Obviously, if you can hit a hard enough ball, you're going to win that way. So that's the right ball for you to hit. It's not the right ball for me to hit yeah. because I don't have that power. I never liked the chippers, I have to say. <laughs> right. So that's why I chip because the chipper yes. deals with people like you. Yes. <laughs> but if I could hit the ball that hard, obviously I would be hitting the ball that hard more. Now, by the way, if you hit it to my backhand, you will get a very hard ball back. You just won't get a very hard ball back from my forehand. So I'm sort of lopsided. You know, when I say like, I want to choose the shot that works, not the shot that makes me feel good. I should amend that and say, choose the shot that works for you. Yes. Right. Because if I could power that ball right down the middle, of course I would, but I can only do it on one side. I can't do it on Mm -hmm. the other side, even though I practice the other side a lot. I just, it's not my thing. It's for whatever reason, I probably started too late to really develop that. So 
I think it's like, know what your own game is, know what your own strengths are, know what your opponents don't like. Because the other thing is, I'm sure you hit the ball very hard, but I'm sure that you come across opponents who like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At which point you have to say, yes, I can hit the ball really hard, but my opponents happen to really like it. So I can still hit the ball hard, but I better put some height on it, for mm-hmm. example. Yes. Right. So you have to like start changing it to get to your opponents within what are the things that you're good at. And I think that that's what's really important. It's like, know what your skill set is, know what you're good at, and know what your opponents don't like. Mm -hmm. More so than what you like to hit. What do your opponents not like? Yeah, I agree. I think that's where really my game elevated when I started more broadening what strokes I hit adding much more spin and really being strategic of when you hit hard versus when you spin up and do a deep lob because that variety exactly. makes people always guessing. So if you always play yeah. the same game, it's going to become predictable. But switching things up, that's when you always have up and in, oh, which shot he she's going to hit now or even on serves is one of the easiest, like even kicking instead of the first serve. So really doing a variety of different serves, I think it's very effective and always switching it up. So the opponent keeps guessing. And I feel like we have a match coming up. If you come visit Austin, we should play. Uh, Yes. Well, no, I think you're clearly much better than I am. So we could play, but I hopefully you would be on my side of the court. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that I tried to think about is like, what's the purpose of the shot, right? Mm -hmm. If you have like a huge power forehand, I think about the purpose of that shot is to push your opponents back to open up the angles, to open up the slice because they're not expecting it because you can then totally get them off rhythm and you can keep them back so that when you hit them short, they can't actually hit anything good off that so that you can set up that ball to be able to really put it away. And the thing is, and it's true in poker. No matter how good you are at something, if you do the exact same thing over and over again, your opponent is going to get used to it. They're going to get rhythm and you're going to find out it's not going to work very well. So what's true, and if you think about decision-making under uncertainty, is that you have to keep people guessing. Yes. And that means like hitting different spins, for example, right? Like you have to always keep people guessing. And poker is all about keeping people guessing. Because the thing that you don't want ever your opponent to be able to do when you're playing poker is to be able to map perfectly the bet that you make to the hand that you have. So like in Mm -hmm. the simplest sense, you can think about what's the purpose of a bluff. And people think that the purpose of bluffing is to win the pot without the best hand. And certainly like that's part of it. If you hit a drop shot, Part of the purpose of that is you're hoping that your opponent is not going to get to it for sure. But the main purpose of bluffing is not about winning the hand right then. It's about making it so that when you do make a big bet later, when you have a really good hand, that your opponent doesn't know that's what you have. Because if all you ever did was bet big when you had good hands, your opponent would figure out pretty quickly that if you bet big, you have a good hand. Mm -hmm. And then they're either going to fold when they don't think they have a better hand than you, or they're going to take all your money when they do. So bluffing is like to keep your opponent off rhythm. It's to make them guess. Look, when I bet, sometimes I have a really good hand. Sometimes I don't. You're going to have to guess at this. And that's what the purpose of dropping the ball is. Like when you watch Alcaraz, for example, he's brought back this idea of drop shotting. Why? Because he hits this heavy, hard, deep ball. And his opponents can't go too far back for that because they don't know if there's going to be this short little drop that's going to come in. So it makes them guess at what's coming Mm -hmm. at them. It makes him much less predictable. And that makes it much harder to sort of counteract what he's doing. So it's very, very similar in that way, right? Bluffing is not about winning the pot right then. Sometimes you do, which is great. But it's about making them guess on later actions that you might take, which is really important. It's playing really the long game and trying to figure Mm -hmm. out how do you get the win. Right. I want to go to poker because I'm so curious about your poker career. You've obviously achieved so much. You're one of the 
best poker players in the world. I'm not anymore, by the way, please. Like I haven't played in so long. I would get my lunch eaten. <laughs> I feel like, especially when it comes to winning, I feel like you've actually still were able to perform and make accurate decision under high stakes table and won some amazing dollar amounts. And so I'm actually curious even about just that, because I think one thing is to play poker or cards that doesn't involve your investment. Another one is really investing the money in it. And, you know, when I'm thinking about it from my perspective, again, I, I actually know nothing about poker. So maybe it's valid decision to never bet money on myself and join poker. But I'm curious how it was for you learning and putting this money in. And obviously, as you grew your career, you had to invest more and more. Does it become automatic? Or what is the pressure difference between low or high stakes tables? Part of what determines the stakes that are appropriate for you to be playing at a table, it comes from your ability to separate the chips from money, Mm. which probably sounds weird to people because you buy the chips with money. But let me explain what I mean. At any time in a poker hand, if you were omniscient, there's a play that you would make that would maximize your expected value, Mm -hmm. right? How much you're going to make on the play. And sometimes that means betting a whole lot with a hand that isn't very good. You have to be willing to sort of move these chips around in a way where you can be putting like a lot at risk, even when you're not holding very much in terms of the quality of your hand. And you have to do that because, again, like it's not a winning formula to only put a lot of money in the pot when you know you have the best hand. You will lose at poker if you do that. Trust me. For everybody out there who's thinking, well, I know I'll just only ever play the best hand. You will lose if that is your strategy. So, again, because you're making the decisions under uncertainty, you're non-omniscient. At any point that you're facing one of those decisions, like should I put a whole bunch of money in here when I don't have something very good? Or should I decide that the other person's going to call? And it's not the right time for me to put the money in, or maybe I should make a smaller bet in order to try to sort of feel them out. If you're thinking about the chips as money, you're going to be much more likely to talk yourself into a less aggressive choice, meaning you might be more likely to fold instead of raise a lot of money or bet a lot of money. You might decide to make like a smaller feeler bet which actually isn't going to get you the information that you need or or do what you need to in the hand. Like, so remember that we're making these decisions where I'm guessing at a whole bunch of stuff. I'm guessing at what your hand is. I'm guessing at given your hand, what I think that you'll do with it. Like, how do you actually view your hand? How are you going to react to a variety of different bets that I might make? And all of those things that I'm thinking about are probabilistic. I don't know those things for sure. And when we think about the problem of cognitive bias, and particularly something called motivated reasoning, where you reason in a way that's getting you to a conclusion that you want to get to, if you're afraid of the money, that motivated reasoning is going to motivate you to choose sort of the less risky choice, which in the long run is going to make it less likely that you're going to win, which is really bad. So you can kind of think about it this way, like if we were playing penny poker, you wouldn't be worried about losing that money. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't matter to you, right? Like you would have a stack of pennies Mm -hmm. and you would be betting pennies. And so at that point, the pennies that you're using would be simply information gathering tools. So when I used to teach poker, what I used to explain to people is that at the poker table, there's a language. It's not the language where I say to you, tell me what your cards are. And if I make this bet, Clara, what would... So obviously you're not speaking in that way, but you can think about it this way. Like if I bet, implicit in that bet is a question that I'm asking you. So I bet, and I'm saying to you, Clara, how much do you like your hand? Because you have to now respond to what I've done. So it's a call and response. It's like a real conversation that's occurring in the way that you're using your chips. So your chips are these tools that allow you to start to unlock things about your opponent. They allow you to unlock your best guess of what cards they have that you can't see that are face down. They allow you to start to unlock tendencies that your opponent might have. When your opponent has a good hand, do they like to raise? Do they like to play it slow? Are they easily bluffed? Are they tight? Are they loose? 
these kinds of questions, you start to sort of unlock that and sort of build out this model of who your opponent is and like what they're holding by using these tools to ask them these questions. That is what your chips are for. So when I used to teach poker, I would ask people like, what do you think the purpose of betting is? Everybody would answer the same thing to make money, Mm -hmm. right? Like I'm trying to get money from my opponent. And I would say that is not even on the list. The first purpose is to get information, to get your opponent to tell you things about them and tell you things about the hand that they're holding. Now, the result of that, if you're good at that, is that you will get money. But that's like a second order effect. It's like not the purpose. It's the result of Mm -hmm. being skillful in the purpose of what the chips are for. So what that means, going back to what we were talking about, is that you have to view your chips as tools, not as money, which means that you have to be playing at stakes that where you can mentally do that. Now, some people can't do that even at low stakes, right? So this is something that you have to train your mind to do. That's the first thing is you have to sort of train this temperament or be born with this temperament Mm -hmm. that allows you to see your chips as tools, like a screwdriver and not as money. But then the second thing is that you have to be playing within stakes that make that easier. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that you've got $10,000 to your name and you play in a game where you're buying in for $5,000. So you have $5,000 at risk. I don't know, maybe you're superhuman, but I don't think anybody on the under those circumstances could separate the money from the chips because you've got half of your net worth on the table that you're putting at risk. So a lot of what poker players think about, like professional poker players think about is what percentage of their total available money are they risking at the table at any given time? Mm-hmm. And most players will only risk between two and a half and 5% in general of the total money that they have sort of available to them, what you would call your bankroll, your poker bankroll at any given time. That's for two purposes. One is that it's just good management of your money, meaning that you're able to withstand the ups and downs. Like if we go back to tennis, you're able to withstand the fact that someone's rolling dice and just giving your opponent a game randomly. So it allows you to stay in the game long enough to overcome what we call that volatility and have the skill show through and still have money to be able to play. Uh, But the other thing that allows you to do is this mental separation between the chips and the money. That right there, if you take those two things, that determines how big a game you can play. And we define the size of the game by just how much money do you have at risk in the game. So poker can vary from a game where the buy-in is $10 Mm -hmm. to a game where the buy-in is a million dollars or more, right? So there's a wide range of choices. In looking at your, again, past and what you have achieved, it seems like you've been able to do this very successfully. So I'm really curious about the separation because it does translate a little bit to tennis. And just give an example, it's kind of the same. We all want to win when you get on the court, but thinking about the winning will only get you more anxious, more tight. You kind of have to forget the, the result and really focus on just that moment and one point at a time. I do find it's a little bit still different in poker because you really see the chips there. So I'm curious, maybe it's from amateur perspective. What were the tips that helped you find that separation and that calmness when sitting at the table? Is there something you would recommend? I actually think that tennis is very similar. I don't think it's all that different. I feel like this just happened to Jabir, Mm. right? Like, yes. You see it all the time. It's hard for people to close sets out. Mm -hmm. You wonder, like, how can somebody who has match point at 5-2 lose a match? And it's like, well, because it changes your play. And it's the same thing as, you know, the money mattering in poker is that if the money matters, it's going to change the way that you're going to play the game. When you're thinking about different shots, Maybe it can cause people to go in different directions. You might become too aggressive. It's usually, though, that you become too tentative, is that Mm -hmm. you play not to lose. Yes. Right? Like, I've got it on my racket. I have to play not to lose. When actually, you should be playing exactly the same way that you played that got you to 5-2 in the first place. But you'll what you'll see is that people will Mm -hmm. sometimes become too aggressive, mostly 
they will start playing not to lose. And then of course, what happens, it would be like me hitting to the center of the court against you. Obviously, I would just lose. I have to take on a little bit more risk than that. So I think it's very similar in poker. And I think that the solution in like both games is very similar is that you have to focus on the task at hand, right? Like if I'm in a hand, I can't be thinking about like, am I winning or losing in the game overall? Or how are things been going? It's what is the right play right now? Mm -hmm. And look, do you get perfect at thinking that way? No, but do you get better? Of course. How do you handle those situations where the right play is to raise and maybe you've lost a couple of hands in a row? And the question is, are you going to raise? And if the answer is no, you should get up from the table. Like you actually shouldn't be playing then, which is a little bit of a difference. Well, it depends on whether you're in a tournament or not. There are situations in poker where you can't get up from the table in that situation. But you have to be able to put yourself in a situation where if raising is right, raising is right. And you should do it regardless of whether you've lost three hands before that or not. Because otherwise, you shouldn't even be in the game. You shouldn't be in the hand. If you were thinking about tennis, ideally, what would happen is that the player would play the point and then someone would say, oh, by the way, you won the match and they'd be surprised. Because they should be playing each point as it is. Now, I understand that there are certain things in tennis that have to do with like managing momentum where you might make some different choices just to stop someone from picking up momentum, but you would do that anyway. Regardless of whether it was match point or not, you would be managing momentum anyway. So you have to get yourself into the mindset where you don't even know it's match point. Yes. Which is different, by the way, than like, obviously you want to know it's 40 love. And the reason that you want to know it's 40 love is because that has to do with like, how are you managing risk and what is your opponent's mindset? Mm -hmm. Like how under the gun are they going to feel? Are they just going to want to get out of the game? Those kinds of things. And those things do come up in poker. If I've won a lot of hands in a row, my opponents are going to tend to be kind of scared of me. So I I'm tracking it in that way for trying to decide like, what's the right play percentage wise. So if I've lost a lot of hands in a row, it might not be good for me to try to push my opponent around at that moment because they might be kind of not scared of me. But that's a separate situation for me being afraid to put the money in in the right spot. It's me understanding that the probability that I'm going to win in that situation is lower because the person does not perceive me in that moment to be lucky. In the same way that if I've won a lot, I should recognize that I should be willing to be more aggressive because my opponent will perceive me as lucky. That's different than not doing the right thing when the math tells you that it's the right thing. And that's where you get into trouble because you get caught up in where am I globally as opposed to, is this the right thing for me to do in this moment? And you have to stay in the moment. And I think that you have to stay in the moment in those spots so much so that that can really be a huge difference between being great and just being good. Mm -hmm. I love that and love how... You're really kind of following and also being aware of the results and the table and how everybody's sensing. Like that is very similar to tennis. You always kind of looking yeah. what the opponent is reacting. Is he she making shots and sort of adapting to that? I have a few more questions about your poker and then I want to move into your books as well because I think they're all fantastic. I've read all of them. I've listened to a few of them a few times. But looking at your poker career. I want to give you an opportunity. How do you reminisce on it now? I've listened to the podcast that people I mostly admire with Steve. I thought it was a fantastic conversation. And you talked also a little bit about being one of the few women or the only woman at the table often. So I'm wondering if you want to comment a little bit of that or even thinking about poker. There's really not the physical difference that you have in other sports, right? In tennis, I always say there is a female power and then there is a male power. Like there's a clear difference between the physiology. Poker is yes. clearly intelligence making decisions game. And so I feel it's one of the few games where women can compete with men at the same table because it's really just about thinking. And then, so that also makes me think of even just your view of why you believe there is still so few women in poker playing and why there aren't more. You know, it's interesting actually that you bring that up. So one of the things that I felt was always weird that I got a lot of flack for was 
like the World Series of Poker, like this is the World Championship. There was a ladies event. Mm. And I was very vocal against it. I did not play in it. I played in it one time, which was before I was a professional. And I hadn't really thought about it. And someone offered me to put me in the event and it was like fun and whatever. But since then, I never played in it because I thought it was insulting. Because I was like, why do you think there needs to be a separate ladies event for a woman to win a world championship? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. Like, as you just said, it's not tennis. Yes. This is a matter of like mind against mind. It's as absurd as having a men's only event. Like, why would you have a men's only event in poker? Like, that would be super weird and sexist. But what's interesting was I got a lot of flack for that from women, which I thought was interesting. So... I still have that stance today. I'll stick by that stance that women are just as good as men at the game. They have the potential to be just as good as men at the game. The things that make it so women don't play, you know, I think are separate from like whether a woman can be amazing. There have been plenty of incredible women like Vanessa Selfs, for example, who I think is as good as any man who ever played the game. And I don't think that, you know, you should say, oh, you go, ladies, go play over there. So I'm going to stick to that, even though I got a lot of flack for that opinion. So I agree with you, right? Now, I will also say, like, in tennis, there should be, like, a men's bracket and a women's bracket. Because, again, we're talking about something where the physical differences between the two biological sexes are quite extreme. And so a woman would never get to win anything in that case. But that's not true in poker. And many, many women have won many, many championships. So then the question becomes like, why aren't there more women? So I actually saw a stat about this year's World Series of Poker, which is like the big main event in poker every year. And the number of female entrants was slightly over 3%. Mm. And I was really intrigued by that because the first year that I ever played in the main event, which was 1994, the number of women who entered were slightly over 3%. Wow. So What I thought was really interesting there is that obviously the absolute number of women who are playing poker is greater just because more people are playing poker, but the percentage of women playing poker has not changed. And I think it's for a variety of reasons. I think number one, it's for the same reasons that women are less likely to be options traders, for example. So you got to unlock that one, right? Like just in terms of those things you're seeing some similarities in certain professions. And certainly when you're talking about poker, it's going to be very similar to something like options traders. I think that women are a vast minority as trial lawyers Mm -hmm. as another example. And I think there's just certain professions where that's the case. So you sort of have to think about why that is. But then also poker is a tough life. And when I think about poker, I have very mixed feelings about my time in poker. I love the game. I do. I think it's a fabulous game that's like super interesting, really intellectually satisfying to try to solve deep, right? So deep. I still think about it today, like, you know, what's the right strategy in the game? But socially, it's hard if you're a woman. Mm. I think that it's, you know, Men don't enjoy, uh, not all men, obviously, but there's a portion of men that are not okay with losing money to a woman. You know, I started off playing in Montana where I was certainly the only woman anywhere that was sitting at the table. And just the sexualization was extreme. The types of, you know, epithets that would get thrown at you. You can think about things that someone might call a woman that would be unpleasant. It was just a daily basis. And what I thought was interesting was when I would sort of look over to the floor man and the answer was always, you're here voluntarily, which was true. Like I'm not in an office. There isn't an HR department. You know, you're here voluntarily. If you don't like it, you can leave. Now I'm super competitive and that just motivates me more. I want to win and I really love the game. So I stuck through it. But from my perspective now, I sort of look back, particularly because, you know, three of my four children are daughters. I'm kind of sad for me, that version of me who was really, I mean, being abused in a lot of ways. Now, again, people would say, well, you were voluntarily being abused. But I think that we've heard that a lot. Yes. If you think back to the way that secretaries were treated in the 1950s, I think they would have said the same thing. If you don't like the job, you can leave it. True. Right? Like, 
you're being voluntarily abused, right? So that kind of thing you hear a lot. Again, I haven't played poker since 2012. It may be better. But then you look and you're like, I don't know, because I, I sort of hear some similar things from women who are still playing today. And I just think that it's hard unless women all of a sudden become 50% of the people who are at the table. I think that when you're in that big a minority, I just think that there is going to be that kind of treatment that occurs. Mm -hmm. And honestly, then you're going to self-select out. That's number one. Number two is it's hard to have a family if you're a poker player. If you're really going to do it, it requires a lot of traveling. I actually had a strange thing happen, which was when right around the time, a little bit after poker became on television, my first husband and I had been having issues and we ended up getting divorced, friendly divorce. We're still friendly today. But what was interesting is that then the week on week off actually aided me in being able to travel because I wasn't missing out on time with my kids because my husband had them. But had that not been the case, as I was having all these kids, I think Mm -hmm. it would have been very difficult for me in the environment that poker became where you had to travel around for tournaments for me to actually maintain that. And right before that happened, interestingly, I was looking at a job in finance to have more stability so that I could be with my kids more. So I think it's hard also Mm -hmm. from that perspective, if you are a woman who wants to have a family or has a family to be able to have a healthy sort of relationship or family life in that way and not feel really guilty and that kind of thing, I think is also very difficult. So I I think that women select out for that reason also. Again, I had a very cooperative ex-husband and we sort of worked it out and It ended up actually working out pretty well for me and my family. But I think that that was sort of an unusual situation that came out of a a divorce, which is nobody's rooting for a divorce, right? Like, so don't get married, have kids and then get divorced so that you can make it so that you can travel around. You know, some of these things are challenges, obviously, that very successful women in any field have to face, which is how do you be a mom, but also be really good at your career? And I think that those things are challenges for all women. We try to make it better for women, and you you certainly see more female representation in the C-suite and businesses, but it's hard. It's really hard. And I think that poker adds extra challenges onto that that make it even harder. The hours are weird, you know, all that stuff. Separate apart from there's just a lot of aggression that's coming at you all the time that's quite difficult. You know, it's interesting. Like, I think like if I had to do it over again, would I do it? And gosh, like I love the game so much. I really did. It was so great. And obviously it gave me this unique perspective in terms of informing the way that I was thinking about cognitive science that I wouldn't have otherwise had. I think that it made me a much better psychologist because I played poker. And the question is, would I be willing to give that up? And interestingly enough, it's not a clear answer for me. I think it would depend on when you ask me. And I think that people would be very surprised that I would say, you know what, if I had to do it over again, I might not have played poker, given what it ended up doing for me. I'm actually not sure what the answer to that is. I I think I could argue both sides of that. Yeah. Thank you for that candid feedback and opinion. I agree with you on so many fronts, even on the tennis courts. There are certain men that are amazing and welcoming, and there are certain men that just hate losing against women. So I totally can understand and imagine sort of that aggression, which probably is even more so in the casinos or where you're playing the venues because there's so much more men. So it's not as visible, probably. And And I think it's like more normalized. There was a podcast that I heard from Malcolm Gladwell, Mm -hmm. which was sort of talking about, you know, women who were coming into the workforce and, you know, the difference between having one and getting to a point where there's like 10 women in the workforce in terms of the treatment. And I remember what he said was that when you look at sort of the break room behavior of men, when there's only like one woman who has now invaded the space, they're more like stereotypically men in the sense of like locker room, Mm -hmm. jokes, like sexualizing sort of, you know, those kinds of things. And then once you get enough women in there, they go back to acting the way they would if there were no women there. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, if there's no women there, they aren't just like body, like 
telling like dirty jokes and stuff like that. But then you put one woman in there and it's almost like a, it's like challenging the situation. And so he was talking about this in the context of what's happened in corporate America, that it took a while to get enough women into positions of power, like in the break yes. room, whatever, that that sort of became normalized. Well, like in poker, again, it's like still only 3% of the people who are entering that event are women. So you're still not in that situation, which I think makes it really hard. I do want to say, like, obviously, all male poker players aren't like this. There are lots of really intelligent, incredibly thoughtful, really deep thinkers, people who really care about the world who are playing poker, as is true in anything that you do. But that is not true of all. It's not all of them. And obviously, the bad apples make it difficult. Yeah. And so what made you decide to quit poker? It was a few things. As I so in 2002, I started to get asked to give talks mainly in finance, thinking about how poker might inform decision making under uncertainty. And so I started to give talks and started to get referred out and started to build kind of this business and discovered that I really loved it. And part of what I loved about it was that it was positive sum, right? It's like you were winning, they were winning, everybody was happy. I found it to be more pleasant. I was happier in that situation. At the same time, toward the end of, from sort of 2008, 2010, the poker economy really cratered because the U.S. government shut down online poker and that caused all sorts of problems in the poker community, which was hard, you know, you're in an environment that has a really booming economy and then it craters. And then some of the online poker sites had legal troubles and my brother was involved with one of those Mm -hmm. sites, which was making his life difficult. And I started a company with someone who had run the the World Series of Poker, and we started it right before that economic crater had happened. And then obviously when it cratered, the company didn't succeed. We were putting on uh, professional tournaments and the company didn't succeed. And that was really hard. And so there was just a whole bunch of stuff that was going on that was just making poker not not fun. Mm -hmm. It's like never fun to have a startup fail and to see uh, the, the economy crater and the thing that you're doing. And I was giving all of these talks, like I'd already, before any of that happened, I was spending the the majority of my time giving talks as opposed to actually playing poker at that point, because I was really liking it a lot more. So then in 2012, I started dating this man and we fell pretty hard in love and he lived in the Philadelphia area and I lived on the West coast and he just assumed like, how are we going to do this? Because you live in the West Coast and you play poker and uh, that's where your life is, you know, and I live in the Philly area. Well, first of all, I'd spent a lot of time in the Philly area and I loved it. And at that point I was really ready for a change. And so when he asked me, would you think about moving? I was like, you know what? I would, I'm ready to stop. I wasn't finding a lot of joy in poker for a variety of reasons. And I was really loving what I was doing in thinking about the intersection of poker and decision-making. And I really loved this man. So I moved to the Philadelphia area. He's still my husband today. I still really love him. That was a very positive choice that I made. And what it allowed me to do was I had been thinking about writing two books. One was writing about sort of like how to an instructional book on poker that was informed by the lens of decision science. And then the other book that I really wanted to write was a book about decision making that was informed through the lens of poker. So in 2011, I actually published a book called I Decide to Great Play Great Poker, which was that first frame I wrote that one first because I sort of thought, well, you know, people know me as a poker player, so I should just write this poker book that I want to write. And so I published that. But I always really wanted to write this other book, which was like, how would you think about decision making through the lens of poker, sort of informing the way that you think about that as a problem. And it was, you know, sort of difficult for me to find the time. So when I moved to Philadelphia, it gave me the sort of time and space to actually sort of think through that book and what it would be. And then 2018, I published Thinking in Bats, which was that book. And people seemed to respond to it, which I'm really grateful for that people liked it. 
And that allowed me to have a much more public face of what, like, there was a small community that was hiring me for talks and things like that through word of mouth. But to get known as something like not as a poker player, but as a decision scientist, which is the way that I'd always kind of thought about myself anyway. And so that was a really nice transition for me. Yeah. And it just seems in the concept of quitting, just going back on what you were mentioning, quitting something you left for something you left even more. It seems like the right decision making and we not all have that path. So I resonated with a lot of what you wrote about in the book of quit, even through my tennis career. I feel like I should have quit way sooner than when I did. Everybody (laughs) feels that way. I feel like I should have quit poker sooner than I did. Mm. But I didn't want to be, it's like, I I didn't want to let them win, you know, that kind of thing. So people feel that way. So that's the thing about quitting is that we generally get to the decision way too late. I think I actually had a little bit of an advantage in my life because I got sick at the end of graduate school. Mm. One of the things that I write about and quit is what I call forced quitting. So sometimes you quit because you decide I'm going to stop this and I'm going to go do something else. But sometimes like you get fired from a job. Well, that's just forced quitting. Mm -hmm. I am forced to quit doing the thing that you were doing before. And in my case, I got sick and I was forced to take time off from graduate school. I was forced to quit what I was doing. And that's when I found poker. And the thing that that really brings to light is that one of the things that I think that we lose sight of when we're trying to decide, should we stop what we're doing, is we don't really consider very well what we call opportunity costs, which is, what are the other things I could be doing with this time? What other things could I pursue? What else could I spend this money on? You know, those kinds of questions. And I think we're pretty bad at considering those things. Well, when you're forced to quit, you have to consider those things. You don't have a choice but to consider them. And what you find out is, you know what? There's a lot of good stuff out here. I mean, I was doing this other thing, but it prevented me from being able to do all these other things that I love. And as an example, like as long as I was playing poker, it was kind of preventing me from writing this book because I didn't really Mm -hmm. have time to write the book. And so quitting poker actually is part of, once I got myself settled on the East Coast, it's part of what allowed me to get enough focus to really sit down and like write a proposal, like do the research, actually sell the book because there's opportunity cost to anything you do, even if you love it. So I have a suspicion, although I don't know any research on it, that people who have some sort of forced quitting event in their life where they just, for whatever reason, they don't have a choice and they have to quit something that they love are more likely to be pretty flexible in their decision to quit things later on. And it's a little bit anecdotal, but one of the pieces of of evidence that I would have for that is actually what's now known as the great resignation. Mm. During the pandemic, we know that after vaccinations, when things start to open back up, all of a sudden people started quitting, like the quit rates, like went through the roof, like every month, like broke a new record. Yes. And so the question was, well, like, why was that happening? Why were people all of a sudden quitting left and right? And what I think is really interesting is that the quitting was not happening in all sectors. It was happening pretty specifically in the service sector. Mm -hmm. So that's like, well, okay, why was that happening in the service sector? Well, it turned out that when you looked farther back in the pandemic, that when the pandemic first hit, there were a whole bunch of people who were forced to quit. In other words, they were fired or furloughed or laid off. And those people were in the service sector because it was like restaurant workers, hotel workers, people like that who didn't have jobs because people weren't going to hotels, they weren't going to restaurants, whatever. And so they were forced out of their position. And then when things opened back up, they quit. When they were offered their jobs back, they were like, "Mm, you know, I don't really like this. I'm going to quit. It didn't just happen in every single sector. And so that for me is at least some support for this idea that I have that, well, They were forced to quit. And so then they explored other opportunities, number one. And number two, they actually had a chance to think about whether they really liked what they did. And that then opened them up, having actually left the thing that they were doing by force, so it wasn't their fault, by force, that when they had the opportunity to make that choice for themselves, they chose to walk away. And I feel for me that that's a little bit what happened, that quitting for me ended up not being quite so scary because it had already happened to me. Yeah. And I agree with it. It sounds logical and it follows kind of the rules of, I think, what you've laid out, even your books and the research. 
Speaking about the books, I've mentioned I've recently read through all of them. Actually, funny, I started from the back, although I've had the thinking and bets book for a long time, you know, when you first talk about it on some podcasts. But recently, through the last few months, started with a quit. I re-listened to it a few times, even did my own podcast on it, then went back to how to decide and thinking bets, which it seems like such a perfect pairing, right? You have to think in bets and probabilities. When you kind of know your probabilities, you got to figure out how to make the right decision. And then when you decide, you also need to evaluate when is the right time to quit. Have you foreseen these three books sort of lining up that way or did it just come to you in that sequence? I'm actually curious. (laughs) Yeah, so I thought I was going to write one book. I wanted to write Thinking in Bats. I thought this idea of like, look, the world is probabilistic. Outcomes are probabilistic. In the short run, whether you've won or lost does not tell you a lot about the quality of the decision. You have to start focusing on the process. You have to start thinking about the forecast. When you're betting, it's like you're investing your resources, time, money, attention, effort into something where the outcome is not perfectly knowable. So that was the book that like I quit poker to write. I knew that I wanted to write that book. So then when I wrote that book, people started asking me, okay, but how? How do you actually do this? And so then that's really where How to Decide Mm -hmm. came from, which was, well, let me actually walk people through, like, how do you actually construct a good decision? And so I wrote that. And then it was like, I'm not going to write another book again ever. But what ended up happening was that there's a very small section in How to Decide, which is on the value of the option to quit. And it's in chapter seven, I think, which is, it's a very simple thing that I say. It's like really just a couple paragraphs where I say, if you have the option to quit, you can decide faster. You don't need to take as much time on the initial decision if you can quit later for the reason that it's less costly if you make an error, if you can actually get out of the thing that you're doing. And the simple example of that is you need much less time to decide to go on a date with someone as you do to decide to marry somebody. Because a date, you can just not go on another date with a person again. So if you make an error and it turns out to be a bad date, it's not such a big deal. So that was it. It was like two paragraphs. I just made that point. Hey, think about whether you can quit. Because if you can, it's going to make your life a lot easier. So when I was promoting that book, I found myself wanting to talk about that a lot. I just kept going back to this idea of like, what's the value of quitting? And then I started to like talk about that, like actually we're pretty bad at it. We actually quit things very late. There's a lot of cognitive biases that create that, the most famous of which is sunk cost fallacy, which is basically that if you've ever had the feeling of like, well, if I quit now, then everything that I've put into this will have gone to waste. And I'm guessing every single person has thought that in their life, including me, you have fallen prey to the sunk cost fallacy because what you've already put into it, you've already spent. And the question is, is it worthwhile to do it going forward? And the way that you would know that you're sort of caught up in the sunk cost fallacy is, would you start it today, having never done it before? Would you start it today? And if the answer is yes, then great, keep doing it. And if the answer is no, you ought to quit. But even when the answer is no, we won't quit because we say, but then everything that I've put into it will have gone to waste. So that's one of a big, big, long list of cognitive biases that make it very hard for us to stop things once we've started it. And I realized, oh my gosh, you have this very valuable option, right? Like starting things is so hard because you're starting them under conditions of uncertainty. I don't have a time machine, so I don't really know how the future is going to turn out. And I have so little information. So I'm going to discover all sorts of new things after I've decided to start. Like I'm going to take this job. And after I start, I'm going to find out that I don't get along with the boss. Hmm. There's no way for me to know that beforehand. Like those cards are hidden from me, right? And also like we change over time in ways that are unpredictable. Maybe when I'm in my 20s, I love a job that's 100 hours a week. But when I'm in my 30s, I don't like that so much because I have a family now. So it might not be the right thing for you like in the future. So it makes it very hard to start things because we're going to discover new information afterwards. And we're sort of afraid of that information. And so it's like, you know, when we think about like getting sort of paralyzed in the analysis of the decision, it's because we're trying to protect ourselves against sort of the bad versions of the future. So I said, but the great news is like, we have this amazing thing, which is this option to quit, which allows us to sort of get out of the paralysis of starting things because, you know, like, look, I can try it. And if I don't like it, I'll stop. 
except we waste it. Like when you say you quit tennis too late because you wasted this opportunity that was available to you to stop so that you could stop tennis, which maybe you weren't enjoying so that you could go do other things that would bring you more joy and more happiness. So it was like during that time when I was promoting that book that I just became absolutely obsessed with this topic. And I think like the week before I had said to my agent, you're not going to see a book from me for a long time. And then like seven days later, I call him up and I said, I want to write a book called Quit. I named it at the time. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I want to have a conversation about grit. I want that conversation that yes, grit is good because it gets you to stick to hard things that are worthwhile. But the problem is this worthwhile part. Like what happens when something isn't worthwhile anymore? You ought to be quitting it. And I feel like someone needs to write the other side of that equation Mm. and I'm going to do it. So he was like, okay, I thought you told me a week ago you didn't want to write a book anymore. I was like, yeah, but now I do. So I immediately, it was in the fall of 2020. So like nobody was leaving their house. And I just started pinging Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler and like Phil Tetlock and Michael Mobison and Maya Shunkar and Barry Staw and Don Moore and like basically like anybody who would get on a Zoom with me, Max Bajerman, Katie Milkman. And I just said to them, like, look, I'm thinking about writing this book about quitting. What are your thoughts? And everybody was very excited to talk about it because I think that they all felt this need that like Grit, which is an incredible book, like I really recommend people read it, that it needed a counterpart, mm-hmm. right? Like you needed to kind of understood that. So I did about two months of just talking to people and then started researching it. By February, I had a proposal that was like 60 pages long. And by the next February, I had turned the book in. Like it was so fast, but I really was like, I'm not writing a book again. This was a book that I just felt like I had to write. And yes, like what you're sensing is this through line from thinking in bets to quit. And it's true. And the reason why I felt like I had to write it was because I realized there was a hole in what I had set Mm. and that I needed to fill that hole. I love it. So that's how that ended up happening. Again, I love all three books, especially now. It seems like I go from one to another and I'm kind of weavering and switching. And there's so much, obviously, in Quid that resonates in my own personal and family journey, as well as corporate life, as I've been now part of corporate for about 15 years, as well as sports Putting this actually in the perspective and in the book Quit, you write fantastic examples of even governments, social initiatives that waste the most amount of money. And I'm actually wondering, just to put this into macro perspective, if you look at all the things that are happening in the world, COVID, inflation, we've been going, economic crisis, even the wars we've been fighting, Afghanistan or the current war in Ukraine, from my perspective. It just seems like many of these main decision makers that get us into these problems are because they're not able to think in bats, they don't know how to decide, and they don't know the right time to quit. So I'm actually wondering what is your idea? Because you're so much smarter about this. How can we actually up-level this wisdom to even this higher level of where the decision-making is so we don't get ourselves into these troubles we are in? This one is such a hard one. I think it's easier to handle on the individual level than the sort of political or national level. We can sort of divide up. Like if we take COVID, you know, it's interesting. Like I see people talking about Decisions that were made at the beginning of COVID as wrong because we discovered new information. Mm. As an example, right at the beginning of COVID, we were like washing down our boxes because what people thought at the time was that it was spread through respiratory droplets. Now, when I look back on washing off my boxes, I don't think that was a wrong decision Mm. because as soon as I found out that it's not spread through respiratory droplets, like I stopped washing my boxes down. But I think that once you start to sort of incorporate that as wrong, then what happens is that you aren't reacting to new information as rationally as you should. In certain situations or when levels of COVID are a certain level or depending on what your own risk is or risk that you might be exposing others to, depending on who you expose that to, wearing an N95 might make sense. And then at other times it might not make sense. Like, if you're outdoors, it probably doesn't doesn't make sense to have an N95 on 
you know, depending on what your risk tolerance is. But what you see is people sort of divide up into camps because they don't want to be wrong. And I think that people don't want to say at the time wearing an N95 in that situation made sense because either we didn't understand things or like there was a certain level of risk that went along with that. Or I feel like I would be particularly vulnerable to long COVID or whatever it might be. And they're not willing to sort of like go with new information. And when somebody else does something, like if a 20-year-old chooses not to get a booster, they're like, you're wrong. And it's like, okay, but the 20-year-old isn't you. If you're a 60-year-old and you're pointing at a 20-year-old who's not getting a booster and you're telling them you're wrong, you're not really helping the conversation along because you're not understanding that people have uh, different risk tolerances and different viewpoints. And they also have different exposure to risk, right? Like a 20-year-old doesn't have the same risk as a 60-year-old, for example. And that's something that I think that on an individual level, we can really work on, Mm -hmm. which is being tolerant of the fact that new information comes in all the time. We should be trying to react as rationally as we can to that new information. We're trying to make the best decision that we can given the information that we have at the time. If it turns out that new information exposes itself to us, it doesn't mean that our old decisions were wrong because we're making the decision based on the information that we had then. And that we should be okay with us changing our mind, but also other people changing their minds. And we shouldn't be pointing fingers. And I think that our discourse would be a lot better if we could incorporate that. Now, hopefully if people, I don't know, like read my books, that would help them to get there. But when we get to something like the war in Ukraine, now it's a different beast. So I remember very early in the war, I did a um, podcast with Gary Kasparov. And I remember saying at the time, it's not going to end. It's going to end either because Putin actually takes all of Ukraine. I'm not sure that even ends it, right? Because I think he has a broader stated goal, which is to restore the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. Either that or he's no longer president, right? Like he gets deposed or he dies. And the question is, why did I have that very strong opinion at the time? Because at that time, people were talking about like off ramps and peace talks and things like that. And I was like, no, it's not going to work. And the reason is that having stated so publicly a goal that was clearly going against what most of the world, particularly the Western world, thought was okay. So this is going to be an identity defining goal, which is I am going to take Ukraine. And at the time he said in three days, then how do you have to do that? Because that is an attack on your identity. This is something that I write about and quit that we all individually feel. Like people who are flat earthers are in this problem as well. How can you abandon that belief when you've so tagged your identity to it? And this is the case for Putin. So Putin either has to succeed in his goal that preserves this identity, or he's dead or deposed, at which point he's forced to quit. And I don't think that there's anything in between And certainly that's borne out, right? Like every peace talk has been a joke. He's like, yeah, a ceasefire. Oh, no, I'm just going to shoot all those civilians over there or whatever. Because I don't think there isn't an off ramp that doesn't involve him getting everything. And as it goes along, if he gets pressure internally, maybe there's some win that involves him getting Crimea and the Donbass, but I don't think Ukraine's going to be okay with that. And I'm not even sure that that would do it. Hmm. Or that that would be the end of it. And I think that this is generally a problem in politics is that people declare their beliefs very publicly. And even in a simple sense of like in America, Republicans and Democrats, they also define those beliefs as like, this is my identity and I'm being defined as distinct from you. Mm -hmm. That is part of what this is. And so then how can you quit those beliefs? Because you have to quit your identity. And in politics, we know that that's death like you're a flip-flopper or whatever. I mean, for Putin, it would be like a total sign of weakness. So I just don't see people coming off of that. And when you do see politicians who say like, I changed my mind, they get attacked. Mm. So I don't really know what the solution for that is. I mean, I think that we all just need to individually think about how do we as individuals get better at this. And then hopefully that somehow translates to uh, the broader populace. I think that it was better before social media, just because we were forced to sort of integrate the fact that we had different viewpoints than other people in a way that we don't now, because we can descend into our 
sort of like echo chambers. But look, these are really tough problems. I have solutions and quit that have to do with how you as an individual can be better at this. How can you be better at changing your mind? How can you be better at quitting things that you're doing? I have uh, suggestions for organizations. You know, if politicians would adopt those suggestions, I suppose they would be better, but I don't know that they could run on plans to stop if things aren't working out, right? Like, I mean, I think that's the problem. So it's human nature and it's a mess. Yeah. We talked about all that is happening in the world and there's a lot. My recommendation would be for everybody to at least read your books. I love your podcast, follow it. But I'm curious, what would you want to inspire people to be doing more of or less of? I mean, the obvious answer is I'd love people to be quitting things more. But what I mean by that is not just, look, it's better for your life if you do more exploration and you try more things over the course of your life. I think that a lot of regrets that people have is that they didn't try stuff, right? They stayed in the same job, you know. But more importantly, and I think this speaks more to the political situation, which is something that I think about a lot, is that I think people just have to be much more open-minded. You have to be willing to change your mind. One of the things that I'm thinking about, which by the way, I'll just preview, I might write another book. I don't know yet, but I'm thinking about it, is I don't think that people have good literacy around figuring out how do I understand the information that I'm being Mm. given? We're so good at incorporating it into our worldview, like interpreting it in a way that supports the model that we already have of the world, that when we scratch our heads and say, I don't understand why the other side doesn't see the truth, like here are these facts. It's like, okay, but they're not modeling those facts in the same way that you are. And by the way, there's facts that you're seeing that you're not modeling in the right way either. And that's how we end up in a situation where people talk about alternative facts, but I don't think it's actually alternative facts. I think it's alternative ways of modeling the same information where you can just model it in a way that like gets you to the answer that you want to get to. And I just really wish that people were much better at holding their beliefs more loosely Mm. And being really open to information that would contradict their beliefs, really understanding how to understand that information and thinking in advance, like, what's the information I could find out in the future that would tell me that I need to change my mind? Because if you don't do that, then when you do cross that information in the future, you don't change your mind if you haven't actually declared or thought about it in any real way in the future. And I think that people don't think enough about like, what would disprove me? Mm. And I really, particularly at this moment in time, wish that people would think more that way. I love it. Thank you, Annie, so much. I know you were so generous with your time. I so appreciate the conversation. Just one thing as I reflect, even on your tennis expertise, I feel like your decision-making really helped you to become almost a elite or a very highly competitive tennis coach. So if you ever want to take it on. I'm not an elite tennis coach. You were fantastic with just the way of your strategy and how you think about the game. What's the best way for people to reach you? Right now, honestly, like the place that I'm the most active is on Substack. I have a Substack called Thinking and Bets and I write there and I do like Q&As with really smart people that I want to talk to. And I write things on decision-making under uncertainty and That's really kind of right now where I'm the most active. I would love it if people went and looked at the Alliance for Decision Education, which is a nonprofit that I co-founded with my husband. And we're trying to bring decision education to every K through 12 classroom. So this idea of like, what do I think would change the world? Well, I think that if you started teaching kids how to make better decisions from the time they were in kindergarten, that would really change the world. And we're trying to do something about it over there. So That's the Alliance for Decision Education. If people are interested in learning more about decision-making for me, separate and apart from my books, a few times a year, I teach a class on maven.com and I'll be doing the next one sometime in the fall. And it's a couple weeks course, you know, a couple times a week with office hours and that kind of thing where it's a pretty good introduction to how to make good decisions and the kinds of things that you think should think about. So people can check me out there. And then you can find my books in the normal places you would find books. Excellent. I also have a website, AnnieDuke.com. You could book me there, I suppose. Awesome. I will ensure to add all of those links. Obviously, again, fan of your books, love your Substack and podcasts as well, especially the season four. I loved your conversation. So thank you. I'll continue to listen. Thank you so much for all you do and you're creating. 
it certainly helps me think about my own decisions and even decisions I make as part of my corporate job. And so I hope I'll inspire many more people to make the right choices for themselves. And thanks a lot again for your time. I so enjoyed this. Thank you for having me. This was a super fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. If you ever have a trip to Austin, open invitation, Annie. We can play tennis. Thank you. You're obviously a very good tennis player. I am a mere 4-0. You would clearly eat my lunch. We'll find a way. It's a fun social game. I hold my own. I'm at the point where I can sometimes beat a low 4-5, but I'm still just a 4-0. But I'm very proud of being a 4-0. You should. I think you should. Thank you Thank so you much enjoyed again. this episode, and, uh, enjoy I want to ask game. you to please Thank do you. two things that, right that would help me Thank greatly. You. When, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcasting platform that you use to listen to this episode. Two, please share this podcast with a friend who you believe might enjoy it as well. It is a great way to remind someone you care about them by sharing a conversation they might be interested in. Thank you for listening. 